Hi, everyone. I'm Scott Branley. And I'm Alicia Coakley. Every member of the church has a story to share, one that can instill faith, invite growth, and inspire others. In this episode, we're going to learn how one man's conversion to the church changed his life and the life of his family forever. Welcome to Latter-day Lights. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Latter-day Lights. We're so glad that you're here, and we're really excited to introduce our guest speaker this week, Doug Brunette. Doug, how are you doing today? Very well, Scott. Thank you, you and Alicia, for this opportunity. I appreciate it. (laughs) Well, thank you for being our guest. And now, I was going to say, and Doug, you are related to Scott, is this correct? No. No, I'm a liar. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I would be happy to be related to Scott. No oh, question. you're the one. Okay, wait, wait, wait. You're the one that he heard in church, right? You gave a talk in church? Yeah. That's, that's yeah. Right. Okay. See, we were talking about his uncle or a couple uncles or brothers and something. Anyway, I'm tired. Don't just don't even. <laughs> you, guys just, you guys just do this show and I'll just sit back and listen. <laughs> yeah. So I actually met Doug last Sunday. He, he actually oh, came perfect. to our ward and spoke. And his story was amazing. Um, awesome. One of the cool things is um, I we uh, we had Trek in our stake this summer, and his grandson was one of my kids on Trek. My oh, wife so and I you are related. Trek. There you go. <laughs> Through Trek. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> yes. Awesome. See, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> well, technically, even- if if I'm his if I'm his gra- uh, his grandson's pa, then he's technically my dad. This is a this is a quite an there amazing announcement here. <laughs> wow, fantastic! Listen, this is one thing you should know about me: I'm never wrong. I'm just less right. Right? That's <laughs> that's all it is. <laughs> well said. Well said. Awesome. Well, Doug, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, thank you. Yes, uh, I was there last Sunday, and the invitation of our daughter Amy, who's uh, son, Carson, received his mission call to the Texas-Houston East Mission. And I got this call from Amy, and she said, would you mind speaking? I thought, wow. Now, Amy is our oldest child, so this is our first missionary as a grandchild. We have three other children, a total of 17 grandchildren. Wow. I have uh, enjoyed life immensely with our my family. Uh, Cynthia Roberts, brunette, is my wife. We've been married for 48 years. Time has passed quickly. You'll probably see that or have experienced that yourselves in many ways. Um, I work for the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for most of my career. Enjoyed it very much as a human resource director in the temple department, uh, director of training and development in the human resource department. And the last 11 years of my employment was as a temple recorder at the Salt Lake Temple and the Ogden Temple. And I thoroughly enjoyed those experiences, going to work, dressing in white every day, and just welcoming people at the temple and helping the temple presidencies I serve. Oh, awesome. You know, that's like one of my dream callings is to one day be able to work in the temple. You know, I just, awesome. that I'm, I'm, I'm envious of that. I think that's amazing. That's so cool. Thank you. I really mm-hmm. enjoyed it. Oh, awesome. Cool. And now you said well, 48 years? That's correct. Married- yes. Okay. Yes. All right. That's a really long time. I mean, it's not eternity <laughs> yet. You have a little longer to go. But I hope so. Close. <laughs> <laughs> it is remarkable. Wow. No. Wow. That's awesome. We met the last. Like you're old enough. Oh, sorry. I was gonna say you don't even look old enough to be married 48 years unless you got married when you were like eight. So. Oh, thank you. You are very kind. <laughs> very kind. So, how do you do it? What's the secret? Well, I think, um, you know, you just have to say life is good. Just approach it that way. And there are things that come along the way. There always are uh, bumps along the road, so to speak. But Mm -hmm. uh, just keep your sunny side up and uh, work your way through it with God's help. Always, you know, our Heavenly Father is there to bless us and his Savior. So how can we lose? That's how I view it. I love your attitude. That's perfect. And of course, when all else fails, just assume that your life that your wife is right. 
that point. Absolutely. Right? Yes, I've, <laughs> I've learned that through a number of experiences, by the way. But you, that is correct. And she <laughs> actually is right. Awesome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great. Well, um, Alicia okay. hasn't heard your story, but I would love to hear it again. I I was like, I was just riveted the whole time during sacrament. I'm like, this is amazing. So uh, why don't you go ahead and share your story today, Doug? Well, thank you. Thank you, Scott and Alicia. You know, it's so interesting. I, uh, I was born and raised in Minnesota. Uh, that's my home state, the North Star State. The, uh, my parents, my father, uh, John Brunette, is uh, originally from St. Paul. And my mother was from Excelsior, which is by Lake Minnetonka, if you're familiar with Minnesota. But they actually met as pen pals when he was serving in the military in World War II. His, uh, one of his companions in his wow. unit was uh, my mother's brother, uh, Uncle Don. And he introduced them by mail. And that's how they developed their relationship through the mail until my father returned home and they actually met. And that uh, correspondence was wonderful. I actually transcribed most of their letters uh, back home and it, they're wonderful letters. And he, uh, they fell in love as I mentioned and were married and I'm the second of six boys. I think my mother always wanted a girl and she kept trying, but they ended up with six boys and I was number two. And uh, yeah, so, my father, I think they reached an understanding. It was never actually stated. My father was raised as a Roman Catholic, and my mother was a Lutheran, her heritage from Scandinavia, from Sweden. And my father, through Ireland and a sliver of uh, French Canada, that's where the brunette name comes from. But, uh, but he took the responsibility. There was never any dispute about it that I ever saw between my parents. He had that responsibility, and he took it very seriously. So at a young age, uh, he would be sure we would always go to Catholic Mass every Sunday. And, uh, of course, I was baptized as an infant. I don't remember, remember that experience. But uh, when I was about seven or eight in the Catholic Church, you have what is called the First Communion. And you dress in white, the young boys and girls. And after your First Communion, you then go to confession and so forth. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment. But it's so interesting because I always felt, when I first became aware of Jesus Christ, I always felt his influence in my life. Now, I know in, in our church, we call this the light of Christ. I, I testify that that is a real and actual thing. There is no question about it. I felt his influence all through my growing up years, uh, long before I became acquainted with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. For example, my father taught me to pray. I remember him kneeling by my bed with me, and he taught me how to say the Lord's Prayer, our Father, and so on. And then uh, the Mary, the prayers to Mary as well, uh, our Savior's mother, which Catholics also say, and so forth. Like with the rosary, you say 10 Hail Marys, and then an Our Father, and 10 Hail Marys, and so forth. So he taught me to pray. But then I had this impression, and this came from the light of Christ. Uh, he indicated to me, actually, uh, through the impressions of the Spirit, that I could, I could say my own prayers. I didn't have to just say rope prayers. I could say my own. And so I started to do that. I'd say the rope prayers, and then I would conclude by saying my own prayer. And, uh, and I felt a closeness to him through those prayers that I made. Um, it was a remarkable experience for me. Uh, now, confession. Just to touch a little bit on that, if you're not familiar with it, you maybe have seen this in movies and so forth. But about every three months, my father would take us to confession. And usually it was in the evenings during the week. And the, the church was always uh, kind of not much lighting. It was kind of dark in there. And then you go into the little booth and you'd wait your turn because there were two sides with the priest in the middle. And he'd rotate back and forth. A little screen would open up, or the screen, but there would be a screen. There'd be a little sliding panel. He'd open it up. You could see him. You couldn't really see him. He, he was there. And then you would begin, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been three months since my last confession. These are my sins. And I never knew really what to say. So I usually said the same thing. I lied three times. 
And then he'd say, oh, okay. And then he would assign me to say certain rote prayers. And until, you know, a number of our fathers, Hail Marys, Act of Contrition, and so forth. And you would say those mm-hmm. prayers in the chapel there. You just, after your confession, go kneel down and say the prayers. Well, I think he began to recognize my voice because on one of the occasions where I said, I lied three times, he said, you know, you really have a problem with lying. And I thought, oh my gosh, he's caught me now. (laughs) Oh boy. So now I have to say, I did say something different on one occasion, which really got his attention. It was after Halloween. My older brother and I uh, would go out and carry, you know, like a pillowcase. And we would just, like kids do in these days, you just get as much candy as you could. Well, I ate mine faster than my older brother. And I knew where his candy was in the closet in our bedroom. So I snuck in there and I would, hmm, boy, there's a Snickers. Or, you know, I just start eating his candy. And I felt so bad. And we went to confession. Okay. It had to be just a few weeks after. And so I, there I am. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I have been stealing. And it got really, really quiet. And he said, what have you been doing? Then I told him about going into the closet and eating my older brother's Halloween candy. There was a long pause. I wasn't sure what he was going to say next. But then he, he started to chuckle. <laughs> he started to laugh. I thought, holy smokes. Oh, my gosh. And so I felt a sense of relief, but somewhat embarrassed. And I think he assigned me extra prayers because I actually had done something that was uh, not you know <laughs> terrible, but it got his attention. So we right. so go through a confession process. But another experience I had with the light of Christ is... I think of junior high, this is when kids back then and even now started to experiment with smoking and into high school, of course, drinking. And I had this strong impression, similar to when I had the impression to say my own prayers. You don't want to be doing that. Don't be doing that. And so I thought, okay, I'm not going to do that. And I didn't. And and then I had another impression that came to me, and it was you know, there are certain things that uh, some of your friends are saying, some certain words, uh, the Lord's name in vain, swearing. You don't want to do that. I said, okay. You know, so I just, as a matter of course, that's a choice that I made after that impression. Now, I was raised in a good family. My mother and father were uh, very kind and uh, very, you know, good examples, so to speak, in terms of their life. Uh, and so I felt they were influenced as well. I remember when they quit smoking. You know, it, it's so interesting, the experiences that you have. But it was a loving home with all of us boys. My mother was a uh, testament at times in terms of patience, but a loving upbringing. <laughs> and, uh, well, then, so I'm in high school, and we were in Rochester, Minnesota. And this is where the Mayo Clinic is. If you know your geography and where the clinics are located, the Mayo Clinics, and that's kind of the home ground of the Mayo Clinic. And so we were there and lived there. And one summer, actually it was between my junior and senior year of high school, I was out in the garage. I like to refinish furniture. And I found this old dresser. So I was out there sanding away and trying to get the old stuff off to make it come back to life. And these two young men, came up, uh, they were walking down the street, they're dressed in white with ties, and they came up and saw me in there in the garage and came over and they introduced themselves. And of course, it really does happen when you are not familiar with the church, they introduce themselves saying elder so-and-so and elder so-and-so. And I thought, well, that's kind of odd. They were young men, they didn't look elderly to me. And I said, oh, hi, you know, and they talked to me a little bit and I said, well, this is interesting. So what are you doing? Well, we're missionaries. And they introduced the church's name. And said, oh, okay. Well, how long are you going to be out here? You know, I figured it was kind of a summer experience. And one was from Utah. One was from Arizona. I remember that. And they, when they said two years, I was flabbergasted. Two years? What? I mean, I was shocked. Two years. It's just, I, this is incredible. And, uh, and then I, I was so impressed But I said to them, you know, we have a Catholic youth group in in my parish. I was a member of the group, one of the officers. And I said, would you be willing to come and speak to our group? And they said, uh, sure. Yeah, we can do that. 
I said, okay, well, let me, let me check with the priest, you know, I'll check with the priest and see what he says. So I called up, uh, uh, our priest, uh, father, let's see, I want to say father Hayes. And I said, father Hayes, we have these, uh, missionaries of the, at that time, Mormon faith. And I just, uh, asked him, you know, would it be possible if they could come and speak to our youth group? They seem like they're pretty impressive. Once again, a long, long pause. <laughs> and then he started to laugh. And I thought, oh, my lands, I've heard that laugh before. And uh, <laughs> and then after his long pause and the laugh, he said, I don't think so. And I thought, oh, my gosh. Mm. I was so embarrassed. I thought, oh, my gosh. What am I going to tell these two young men? The interesting thing is, I never heard back from them. <laughs> so oh, really? they, they did not follow up. They did not follow up with me. But in wow. a sense, I I was relieved because I was so embarrassed. Because I was so reassuring they could come come and speak. So okay, so that was the summer between my junior and senior year. So now it's my senior year in high school. And there are three individuals, young people in my class, my senior class, that be, I became very acquainted with that were members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There were five total, but there were three in particular, uh, Mark, Don, and Tracy. Now, Mark was in my English class. He sat right behind me, and boy, what a he was really smart. And he is still very smart as a doctor, just really a smart young man. And, uh, and Don, um, he was on the baseball team with me. And he was a pitcher, and I played in the outfield. Uh, just a really nice young man, but kind of a character. He was Rochester's pool shark. I mean, if he wanted to make money, he'd go down to the place where they play pool. He'd play some bets and, you know, he'd win. And uh, so that was him. And then Tracy, she was a young lady that I met when I decided it would be fun to maybe participate in some theatrical productions at high school, which she was very much involved with. So I met her. Well, Don... We had a game. This is the spring now of my senior year. We had a game in Winona, Minnesota, about 40 miles east of Rochester. And we're driving back from the game. And Don is sitting next to me. Now, you have to realize on these buses with young men in high school, a lot of them are telling things you wouldn't want to hear. Stories and stuff. Just, you know, I just not good stuff. But Don, he's sitting next to me. I didn't realize he had become a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He said, let me tell you something. You think there's just a heaven and a hell? And I thought, well, uh, as a Catholic, I know there's purgatory as well. And he said, well, let me tell you, that's actually, let me explain it to you. And so then he started explaining to me, and I was sitting there listening to him. He said, well, there's a highest degree. It's like the sun. Oh, okay. And then there's the moon and the stars. Oh, and so people, depending on how they live, they can go to one of these three. And so I'm listening to this, and I'm thinking, this is Don? the pool shark of Rochester <laughs> preaching to me the, on the baseball bus. Uh, and I thought, wow. And he was very kind. And I listened to him and I, I thought it was an interesting story. Uh, but that was kind of my experience with Don on the bus. And then Tracy, you know, I thought, you know, she's, he's a really nice girl. I think I'll ask her out. I, I took her out and so forth and became acquainted with her. And then she, uh, to her, courage and credit, she said, would you have an interest in going to our church where, you know, I said, well, I had gone to some other churches besides my own, just, you know, just to kind of see what they're like. And I never found anything that interesting. And I thought, well, sure, why not? I will, if you'll come to mass with me before. And <clears throat> she said she would. So I remember distinctly the mass that she attended with me and see Father Bush was the one who was uh, conducting the service. It was just when the Catholic Church started to sing hymns in the uh, during Mass, and it wasn't that great, honestly, the singing. And <laughs> and I wanted Father Bush to give this really amazing sermon, and he did a pretty good job. It was not bad. And then afterwards, we drove over to the uh, churches, our church's uh, location, uh, and uh, a chapel there in Rochester. And I noticed it didn't have a cross. I thought that was interesting. 
walked up to the door. And this is when I had my first experience, strong experience with this testifying power of the Holy Ghost. So the door opens. I, I start to walk in and then I get this impression. You are in the right place. Wow. Hmm. And I thought, what? And I, then I stepped a little further and then suddenly all these people started coming up to me and introducing themselves. Very kind, considerate people. Just, I thought, wow, they, they're really interested that I'm here. They really care. And I was so touched by how kind and friendly they were. Now, in the Catholic Church, you go together as a family, you go to the Mass, and afterwards you, you scoot and head home. You know, you're not talking to anybody. You head for your car. At least that was my experience growing up, and I don't think it was unique. You did your obligation, you head for home. So I never experienced people actually talking with one another and having that uh, kind of interchange. And, and so then I attended their service. I did have an experience there that was somewhat unique. I, as part of the service, they were sustaining officers to positions, and I didn't really understand it. I was into political science, and so when they said, are there any opposed, I raised my hand because I didn't know who I was voting for. <laughs> How am I going to? You know, I, I need to hear them speak or do something. <laughs> and, of course, Tracy sitting next to me, she quickly pulled my hand down. Says, no, no, it's, this isn't a vote. We're just sustaining you. I said, oh, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't know. So, um, you know, it, it was, I learned something, which was good. And, and I wasn't embarrassed too much. And then we went to a, a little Sunday school class. And I remember that George Pingree was our Sunday school teacher. He was a doctor at the clinic. Later on, just as a side note, his wife, Sister Pingree, was a member of the General Relief Society Presidency of the Church a, a number of years later. So that I thought that was kind of interesting. But he, he, but he spent That's cool. the, like the entire time, 45 minutes, 50 minutes in that Sunday school class, going over four or five verses in the Book of Mormon. And I was enthralled. I thought, oh, this is incredible. Because he'd make a comment and there'd be... People making the young people making comments, and I, I had never experienced that before. That really, because when I attended catechism, you know, the nun would get up and she would give instruction, you know, about a, a principle, which was fine, you know, God, who is God? God is everything. Where is God? God is everywhere, and all of this. I, I never had an experience of sitting down and having, you know, where you're talking back and back and forth with your teacher, and mm -hmm. just it, I, I, it really, really mm -hmm. surprised me. So what I did the remainder of that summer before I went to college is I would go to mass and then I would drive over and attend the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And at that time, they had actually two times you'd attend in the morning, come back later on, attend later on. And it was uh, really a great experience. I received a Book of Mormon from the members, which I appreciated. But that fall, I was going to... St. John's University, a Catholic university in Minnesota, where my older brother had gone. And so off I went after enjoying my experience there in Rochester, attending the two churches, but being very touched by that impression, you are in the right place. It just, I thought, wow. So I go up to St. John's and I had an experience there, another experience with the Holy Ghost indicating to me something in a powerful way. And this happened with my roommate, Mark, just a fine young man. Uh, you know, we had, it was a bunk. I was in the uh, bottom bunk. He was in the top bunk. And he said, you know, uh, we, my mother had really a sad thing happen to her. And I said, well, what happened? And uh, he said, well, we had, she had a baby and the baby did not live long enough to be baptized. Now, in the Catholic Church, if that happens, that infant goes to limbo. It's called limbo. You probably heard of that uh, mm -hmm. idea of being lost in limbo or something. Well, it comes back to that, right. that doctrine, that belief that if you're not baptized, you know, as an infant, then you're going to go to limbo. And he said, my mother had a nervous breakdown. And I, I told him, I said, you know, if you want to know something, that is... Uh, that's not really true. I need to read something to you. And so I picked up my Book of Mormon, which I've been reading, 
and I was in Moroni, chapter 8, and that's where Mormon instructs Moroni about you do not need to baptize infants there without sin. And I read, Mark, a verse from Moroni. It's uh, Moroni 8, verse 20, where it states, And he that saith that little children need baptism denieth the mercies of Christ, and setteth at naught the atonement of him and the power of his redemption. And Mark mm. is really quiet. Then he said, what are you reading from? I'm reading from this book that my, my friends gave me from the LDS faith. And he said, uh, really? And after he heard those words, we got really quiet. And the Holy Ghost then let me know this is a true principle. This is a true principle. I thought, oh, my goodness. Well, of course, at any religious school, you need to go to religion class, and which I did, of course. And I remember the book. It had a green cover on it. And I also remember going through the book. And every time I saw a principle that I felt was not in keeping with the principles I was learning in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I would underline those. And I would write along the side, this is not true. No, not correct. And my book was all marked up. Now, <laughs> wow. Oh, my goodness. I'll be honest with you. I, uh, because of that, because I couldn't answer the questions really totally correctly, in that class, I got a C plus. Okay? Uh, some of the principles were okay, but some of them were not. They just weren't. And, and so I, I, I thought, wow. Well, then I had another impression come to me. My friend Don and Mark, whose father was the bishop of the ward in Rochester, they had gone to Brigham Young University. I thought, oh, Brigham Young University, what? Oh, it's named after that fellow who took those people across the West. And we all read about it in history class when I was growing up. It was an interesting story. I didn't know much about the faith then. I, of course, I knew more. And I read about the university. I was very interested in political science, international relations. I discovered they had a double major. Wow, I wonder if they'd accept a Catholic. And and so I applied and I thought, well, I don't know what you what are you doing? But I did. I applied. And then about uh, I'd say about three or four weeks later, this big envelope arrives up at St. John's from Brigham Young University. <laughs> I'm <laughs> glad I got through their mail system. And I remember opening it up and I thought, well, is this some kind of rejection? What is this? We are Pleased to inform you that you have been accepted as a student at Brigham Young University. And I thought, wow, you're kidding me. Well, <clears throat> the next traumatic experience I had, probably the one of a number, is so my father, he came up to the university to pick me up to bring me home after the school year. And as we were driving home, I said, Dad, I, I, I'm not coming back. He says, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, you're, I was on the... Uh, the soccer team, I was on the baseball team, I was vice president of our freshman class. And he says, what do you mean you're not coming back? You're not living now all that behind? I said, I'm telling you, I'm not coming back. I'm gonna go to Brigham Young University. No, you're not. Yes, I am. <laughs> no, you are not. Wow. And so we had this back and forth, but, um, and so the summer was kind of rough. You know, I had my summer job and all of that. And uh, But then at the end of the summer, my father, I knew he loved me, and he took his, uh, his footlocker from his service, and he was in the National Guard, and he varnished it, got it all ready so I could put my things in it from our trip out west, and he gave me his cameras. He said, I'm talking cameras he used through our growing up years, movie camera, mm -hmm. his just regular cats. Oh, you need to record your experiences. And so I knew he was telling me in his own way that uh, he cared about me, even though he didn't agree with me. Mm -hmm. And I know he did it because he, he did care. You know, sometimes we think when our parents or those who are over us, responsible for us, uh, you know, we're being disciplined or something like that. Well, no, it's because mm -hmm. they care. That's why they're doing what they're doing. And but he, uh, he understood. So Don, he uh, helped me load up my stuff in his 58 Ford. And we 
headed west. I remember this trip to Sinkley, my first trip to Yellowstone, driving through the dark, missing a bunch of cattle in an open range area I'd never seen in my life. Uh, <laughs> arriving in Logan <laughs> late into the night. And uh, if I'm going on too long, you just tell me. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> so I have, I, have, yes. I have a question for you. Please. So, so at this point, your parents obviously knew that did did you tell them you were attending both churches at you know and like what were their uh, thoughts about about this crazy idea and about the church in general because they were Catholic at the time right like there's yes. practicing yes yes well I, my father I, actually I must now I have to make a confession to you and I will <laughs> so it got to the point later in that summer before college I would go over and park by the Catholic church, but not go in. I just sat in the car. And so okay. my dad my dad drove by on one occasion when he thought I was attending the 830 mass and saw me sitting out in the car. He was not happy about that. He said, what, what are you doing? And, and I would just stay there until I would go over at 10 o'clock to the <laughs> Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, he was... Um, no, no, he was very concerned. He said, no, you'd be sure and find the Catholic Church out there in, in Provo, Utah, you know. And uh, so, no, he was he was concerned. Um, I, it, does that make sense, just what I'm saying? I mean, mm-hmm. my yeah. uh, oh, oh, and one time, another time, he said, you know, if you continue doing this, you will no longer be my son. And uh, Oh, wow. My gosh, you know, and then my mom quickly comes. I remember this because I was in the kitchen. My father walks out. My mother walks in and she said, don't believe that. He doesn't mean that. And uh, she wanted to put me at ease. He was just frustrated. You know, he was yeah. frustrated. But um, I, I just I just knew I needed to do what I was doing. And I just felt I had too many witnesses of the, the spirit, I guess, on key times. No guessing, really at key times along the way that let me know I was on the right path, uh, even though I was walking it by myself mm-hmm. uh, with good friends. I had good friends. So, so the, the fact that your dad gave you that foot locker, I mean, that mm-hmm. had a lot of meaning behind it. Yes, it did. Yes. Okay. You know, at that time, it, it's so interesting, just generation to generation. I, I had never ever hugged my father, you know, he just, he just didn't do it. You know, I would shake his hand and him showing affection to me was he did. He kicked me in the, you know, playfully in the back, in, in the rear, give me a little kick, yeah. you know, then he'd <laughs> smile and laugh. That was how he showed affection. <laughs> right. so, and I knew, I knew he cared about me, but you know, there was not the, you know, what we're seem to be so accustomed to the big you know, hug or embrace or, you know, a little bit more, didn't have that. And so it was shown in other ways. And and I picked up the signals. Nice. And they were good. So Okay. Yeah. So All we right, to, so now you're in Provo. Almost to Provo. We we okay. stopped in we stopped in Logan. This is just a little side experience. We were looking for a place. We had a tent and there was a really nice grassy area there. It was really dark. It was probably like after midnight. So we set up our, our tent, our pup tent there. And the next morning, I noticed it, the sun was shining into the tent, but the, it was raining. I thought, what? How can this be? So I opened the flap of the tent, and there are sprinklers that have come on. <laughs> and I'd never seen sprinklers. I'd never seen an irrigation system <laughs> ever in my life. And, and then I realized we, are, oh, really? we were on the Logan Tabernacle grounds, right in the corner <laughs> there. Yeah. The main drag of Logan. There we are with oh. our tent by a big spruce tree in downtown Logan. So I just thought I'd share that. That was one of those experiences. Um, and, and, you know, we headed down to Provo. Now at St. John's almost every evening, the young men, we, we pop popcorn and we'd sit around and we'd talk to each other. And most of the discussions at that particular point, and they usually got fairly deep about life. They were kind of, I don't know. Um, pessimistic is all I can say, you know, about life and the purpose of life and what we were doing and Mm -hmm. what was happening in the world. It was just kind of a, kind of a downer in a way. I enjoyed the popcorn, but the discussions were not that uplifting. 
uh, you know, but they were good. They were good discussions, just didn't really lift your spirits that much. Mm-hmm. So then I arrive at uh, BYU at Stover Hall, and these young men, I got acquainted with them, and they seemed to know that they had the purpose of life. This is the purpose of life. And they had such a different perspective. It was so uplifting. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. So I'm in there shaving in the Stover Hall, and this good brother comes in. I think he was uh, probably one of the, had, had an, a position there in the church, in our student ward. And he said, are you Doug Brunette? And I says, I am. And, and he introduced himself. Well, my name is Tom Hunsaker. And would you help us out at our opening social? And I thought, oh, well, what would you like me to do? Well, um, if you could just help with some of the games you're going to play. I said, sure. So we go up to the Wilkinson Center, if you're familiar with uh, the campus there. They have an open area there they did at the time. And I thought, well, this is great. Everybody's happy. You know, we're all, everyone's excited. And so I'm cheering. I think this is, we're going to play games. And then I look up and I'm kind of, hooting and hollering. And there's a fellow up there with folded arms, you know, about to say a prayer. And I thought, what the heck is he in a prayer? So I, I was kind of em- embarrassed. Because I thought this was a social event. I remember it was Vaughn Benson. Yeah. Vaughn Benson from Idaho. Nice, nice and return missionary. And, uh, and so I had that another embarrassing moment in my inaugural orientation in the church. Uh, so I, wasn't long after that that the at that time state missionaries assigned to our particular area were asking if I would be willing to take the missionary discussions, um, and I said, "Sure, I'll do that." Mark, by the way, was my roommate there at uh, BYU. Oh, okay, yeah, so it was great to have Mark there, and so I started taking the missionary discussions. And I remember the very first time they asked me to pray. I had never prayed in front of other people. I hadn't been asked at that point. And so now I'm going to offer a prayer. And it was difficult. You know, they kind of told me the framework, you know, how you start, and things you say, and how you end. But it was hard. I mean, that first initial time to actually say a prayer in front of other people, because all of my prayers up to that point had been my own private prayers, never in front of others. So I... You know, it's, mm-hmm. I know it seems kind of odd, but it was hard. And, uh, but I got through it. And I went through the discussions. So I went through the school year as an investigator. I did have an experience in the early morning Book of Mormon class. It was a 7 a.m. class. And we were in First Nephi, I remember. And it talked about the great and abominable church. And the uh, instructor there, he then basically said it was the Roman Catholic Church. And I can remember standing up and telling him, I'm a Roman Catholic. And what you're saying, I don't agree. It's, that's not right. I have many friends. I have priests. My family are Roman Catholic. And I just want you to know that. And I sat down. And I got really quiet in that class. And then Tracy, who was in the class, she then stood up and said, look, I, I just need to let you know that Doug is a member of another faith and, and uh, you know, just to be aware of that. And the instructor, he apologized. Uh, so I did have that experience in one of the religion classes there. And what I found for me, what I found personally is, uh, you know, there are good people in every faith, very good people. Yes. And there are some awful people in yep. all aspects of life, whatever their faith is unfortunate. What makes a church true? What makes the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints true are the principles of the church, the doctrines of the church. That's what makes it true. The people, Mm -hmm. they do the best they can. Some do really well, some struggle, and so forth. And that's life. But you've got to hold on to the doctrine. You cannot let your testimony be based on people. You have to base it upon the principles of the church, ratified by the Holy Ghost, that gift, so that you have a strong foundation. You have to have that foundation. If you don't, Mm -hmm. then I've seen it happen, and unfortunately it can happen, where people then, if they rely upon others for their testimony, and uh, those tests come in life, and they haven't got that firm foundation, it gets 
it gets hard. So yeah. I, I knew I needed that. Before I could be baptized, I needed to be sure my foundation was strong. And it was based on principles and doctrines that I knew were true. Um, and that happened the next summer. I, uh, I, I reached a point where it was like the Holy Ghost said, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? The principles are true. The doctrines are true. And, uh, and so that August uh, of that summer between my sophomore and junior years is, is when I knew it's time. It's time that I'm baptized. And the minute I made that decision, it was like this great weight had just come off my shoulders. It was just a, a sense of relief, just a great mm-hmm. sense of relief. And, and so on August 3rd of that summer, I met Mark with Don observing and Tracy and all these good people who were so kind to me there in Rochester. I can remember as I was going under the water, when I came out, I could feel the water coming off of my face. As I looked through the, the droplets going down off of my face, I looked out at these people and I thought to myself, I am so blessed. I am so blessed. Yeah. And uh, later that, actually within a day or two, my father, he said, did you become a member of that church? I said, you know, Dad, I did. And you know why? One of the major reasons I did is because the principles I was taught in my home on being Christ-like and kind and loving that I were taught in my home, I found in that church. Wow. So, Doug, how did your dad receive that? You know, I mean, first of all, kudos to you because that was amazing. It was it was almost like you weren't trying to defend your decision per se. You were just trying to like lovingly explain it, you know? So like, how did he, how did he respond to that? Well, it was, he, it was very quiet. He got very quiet. He, he didn't say anything and he didn't argue with me or raise another point. I think he felt like what I was saying had truth in it and he didn't dispute it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, it, it was okay. Actually, it was it was somewhat uplifting because it didn't lead to any contention or a negative response. Uh, I think he understood how I felt and, and what I believed. Well, and obviously, it, wow. you had been thinking about this for a long time, right? This is this this happened over a course of what a couple of years. Yes, from the yeah, okay, that's mm-hmm. right, yeah. It it took a while. It, <laughs> I mean, compared to some experiences that our good missionaries have, I I guess I was uh, I was a longer story for sure regarding that. That's correct. Yeah, it, it took a while, but you know something? Because of that, for me personally, it made my foundation stronger as a result. You know, just uh, I mean, I, there was no looking back. I, I I have been blessed in so many ways through the. Uh, the spiritual experiences I had along the way, the affirming, affirming power of the, the Holy Ghost and the love of the Savior from earlier years that I, I, I just felt that, um, that, yes, I'm doing what I should be doing. This, this is right. Awesome. Mm-hmm. So then awesome. you got baptized, right? <laughs> I sure did. Yes, I got <laughs> baptized. and You know, it's so interesting because the confirmation was also very special and it occurred the next day in church and it was done by a, just a Kent Hardy, just a wonderful man. He, uh, he was a doctor there that uh, he did the confirmation. And then we had a fast and testimony meeting and each of these people who had touched me so deeply, uh, I was able to bear my testimony. Don bore his testimony Mark bore his testimony. Tracy bore her testimony. Uh, It was like, you know, a a spiritual ribbon being put around this package of becoming a member of the church. You know, it's just uh, uh, that day was uh, so uplifting. That weekend was so uplifting for me in so many ways. That's awesome. Awesome. So did your did your parents attend your baptism? They did not. No, no, they did not. Yeah, they. uh, I think they were still perplexed, honestly, about what was happening. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And it was hard for them. It was really hard because they cared about me and what was happening and wondered. I remember on one occasion, my father and I think Tracy's father, they somehow ended up at the Minneapolis airport at the same time awaiting our arrival. And my father was, he got so upset with Tracy's father. Tracy's father was really outgoing and somewhat um, aggressive in his testifying about the church. And my father, Mm -hmm. we got home later that night. My father said, you know, I almost punched him in the nose. (laughs) So he was so so frustrated. He didn't want to hear another thing from that man regarding the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. (laughs) You know, smacked him right in the mouth. Oh, good. This is this is just what we need right now. Thank you, Dad. But he, to his credit, he did not. He did not do that. But he, he had it in his heart, maybe, to do something. So mm-hmm. it was an interesting, interesting ride along the way in, in a variety of ways with the family. And I, I know that it was very difficult. And there were other things, you know, even later on, that were hard. I mean, at that time. I'm skipping way ahead here, but when Cindy and I were married, my folks drove all the way out from Minnesota to be there with my brothers. And so, you know, we're in the temple and they, they can't see the service. They're down there in the waiting area. You know, they can't be up there. And, and and so there were things along the way that were, it was tough. But um, years later, after that, our, um, daughter, Mary Ann, was a musical performing missionary in Nauvoo. And my father, my mother had passed away, but my father, he joined us there at Nauvoo. He loved it. He loved that experience with our, our, our granddaughter, Mary Ann. And uh, as a matter of fact, he came back on his own three more times to Nauvoo because of what he felt wow. there. So, oh. and... And Marianne gave him a Book of Mormon, and she wondered if he had actually read it. Um, and then this this last 10 days over Thanksgiving, Marianne was talking with Melinda, our youngest daughter, and Marianne thought, you know, I had this impression. My father passed away, and she said, I had the impression he actually had read it. And then Melinda said, well, you know what? When we were in uh, their home in Rochester, Minnesota, Grandpa had the Book of Mormon right there in the living room where he would sit and read. So he, yes, he read it. So, and of course I've done my folks' temple work, which was a choice experience for our family. So, you know, sometimes it takes, maybe it takes a little time, even uh, longer than this life, but absolutely it can happen. And uh, and so, you know, so I've I've skipped ahead just to share those little experiences with you that were quite wonderful really later awesome wow. so oh, did you you uh got baptized then did you serve a mission yes so then uh okay so <laughs> i got <laughs> i got my mission call to uh i did the, the bishop mark anderson's uh father the bishop asked if i'd serve as a missionary and he did that in this, the Christmas break after I was baptized. So it was about four, five months later. And I, I said, absolutely. How could I not? I had been so blessed. I felt so blessed. Mm-hmm. And uh, certainly I will. And, and so I got the mission call the next summer. And you have to wait a year. And so I got it just a few days after my baptism, a year later, to go to Guatemala, El Salvador, Spanish speaking. and. You know, I just, but once again, my parents they were so concerned. What are you doing? My, right. my older brother was in the Peace Corps. He had gone um, a year before. He was in North Africa. So here I am. I'm going to be a missionary in Central America. And I think that's traumatic for parents. But I thought, mm-hmm. no, I need, to, I need to do this. I need to do this. I need to give back. I've been so blessed. But it was uh, when I drove up that early morning in, in August, with my folks to the airport, they were they were definitely in distress. They were it was so somber. We hardly said anything. It was just a sad ride up there. It was really sad. Um, but you know, but here's the thing. So during my mission, which was an incredible experience for me, because I was in Guatemala, Salvador, 
I mean, 95 percent plus of the people were Catholic. So we would approach people okay. and they would say, somos catolicos, we are Catholic. And I would say, oh, I was a Catholic. Let me tell you what happened to me. <laughs> and it opened so many opportunities. It was amazing. And I have good friends to this day, their children and their grandchildren who have served missions, who have, are faithful in the church. And through the miracle of Facebook, we communicate almost every week. And it's just an incredible thing. But during my mission, we had a visit from a general authority, Elder Richards, and he said to me, remember, Elder, this mission is your life in miniature. It's your life in miniature. And that thought came back to me when I flew home from my mission. And the plane arrives in Minneapolis two years later. I'm the last person off the plane. I walk out. I see my folks. I see my brothers. They are all smiling and overjoyed. And I thought, I felt the spirit and said, look, life, this is, mission was a life in miniature. The time will come in the future when this time is over in this life where you'll have a glorious reunion once again, just like now. I had that strong impression. So that night, my parents had an open house for me. Neighbors were coming over. There were refreshments. They put an article in the paper about my mission. You know, it was just Aww. the whole thing, the, the contrast of leaving and then coming home and having that, that experience to me. I'll never, ever forget that. It was unbelievable. Aww. So That's, that's amazing. amazing. Yes. Aww. Yeah. So, so I, I just feel it sounds like It sounds like your mom was a little more receptive to this whole thing. Is that accurate? Yes, she was um she was kind of the kept the pot from boiling over, so to speak, emotionally. She was a leavening uh, power there for us and for the family mm-hmm. and, and for me and of course with my father and and yes, she was. Now it was really difficult, you know, when we weren't able to because I didn't end up working in Minnesota, I ended up working out here. So we would have visits, we would go out and they would host us, you know, and, and our children, and they were wonderful. When they would come out here, I could tell they never felt totally comfortable. They felt much more comfortable back home when we would visit there. And we had wonderful times there. They were the highlights when we went out to visit. It was great. But uh, she always wanted to in- involve us, wanted us to attend various family activities, to be fully engaged with the family there, with the her side of the family, okay, the Irish Catholic side, my father's side, <laughs> were more serious, uh, mm-hmm. al- almost stern, but not quite stern, just a little serious, where my mother's side, the Scandinavian side, oh, my gosh, life is great. You know, they were happy, <laughs> and they hug you, and it was just a, mm-hmm. two different cultures, really. It was so interesting. Um, awesome. But, yeah, she was, she was uh, definitely – very helpful at those critical times when my father, I know, was very frustrated. That is true. Yeah. Mm. What are, What about I, your I siblings? Asked, how did Yeah. How did being a member of the church affect your siblings? And did any of your siblings ever join? Thank you for asking that question. Um, I am the only member of the church okay. in my family, and I know that um, they saw what I experienced, what I went through. <laughs> Because I made this change, and I think it was they were not able to take the same path that I took. They they were uh, now we're very close. Actually, I'm close with all of my brothers. It's not like all of my brothers are close with each other um, as Mm -hmm. siblings, but I am close with all of them. And and so you know we I joke, we have great times, share gifts. Um, You know, it's all all very good for me with them. So it hasn't affected my relationship with them individually, uh, like I say. But I know it was they, they did not want to go counter to uh, the experience, you know, that I had. They, I think, it just was not them. I, I can remember approaching my next youngest brother, Jim. He was at Arizona State University, and he came up to BYU for a conference there, and I met with him. And I, I remember, had a book of Mormon to give to him. He says, "No, I can't take." I can't take it. Mm. And so I knew 
that, that there were things that were probably said or felt regarding it that uh, made it difficult for them to take the same path I took. And, and that's okay because I'm, a, yeah. I'm the pioneer. I shared this with Scott earlier uh, in the week, and I, I told him when Cindy and I, we went to one of these family history centers that we have now, regional ones. There's one in Layton, Utah. Um, it's like the big one downtown in Salt Lake, but the smaller scale. And they have this program where you can go up and put your name in, and it'll show all the people you're related to, famous Americans, uh, right. leaders of the church, and so forth. So Cindy, she types in her name. Her heritage goes back through the pioneers. And all these names show up, you know, apostles and prophets and presidents. And, oh, this is incredible. I'm not going to try that. Oh, you know, I'm really into history. So I put my name in. Nothing. Nothing. The program says, we're sorry. There are no connections with any. I'm like, okay. Well, I guess I'm a, pi- I'm a pioneer. I'm a pioneer. That's okay. Yeah. Well, there you go. A modern day pioneer. <laughs> well, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, and it'll be neat because, you know, one day you're going to be able to look at that line and, and like everyone's in your, you know, in your, not downline. What do you call it? Downline's more of a business. <laughs> anyway, and, you, and your descendants. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, Thank you. They're going to be like, oh, wow. Look, I was, I was related to Doug Burnett. <laughs> so, you know, you just might be the one that's up there and that everyone else is, I don't know. It's not going to be Google then. I'm sure it's going to be something fancier, you know, some <laughs> weird thing that's implanted in our eyeballs or something, but you get to be the one. <laughs> well, you're so kind. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Very cool. Well, you know, I, that's, there's some truth there, Alicia, but, and it's not, maybe not necessarily even with your brothers and sisters and your parents. I mean, I, you are going to be um, an influence in their lives for sure. But I'm thinking mm-hmm. like from the moment you joined the church, you know, you went on a mission, all the people whose lives you affected there. Right. Mm-hmm. And then your, then your kids and there, yeah. and now your grandkids, right? Like all of these lives have been affected. Um, and you, yeah, like you're kind of that, that pioneer that kind of kicked that all off. And that's pretty cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, yeah. I feel like I say, I just feel so blessed beyond measure. Really. I just, so blessed. Feel so blessed. Awesome. That's amazing. Well, um, wow. is there any other thoughts you'd like to share or any parts of this, the, the rest of your story that you'd like to, to tell us about? I, I will share another experience that would really touch me. And it ties in with the experience I had with my roommate up at uh, St. John's when I read from Moroni chapter eight about infant baptism. I, it was the, the night before we were to fly out to go to Central America. And I was, I was really kind of nervous. I was very nervous because I wasn't really sure, you know, is this really, am I, are people going to understand me? Am I going to have any success? You know, all these things were floating through my mind. And I um, turned to Moroni once again in that same chapter. And later in there, it there's this, I think it's verses 16 and 17, where it says, uh, I fear not what man can do, and uh, for I have the authority from God. And uh, I am filled with charity, which is everlasting love. And for love casteth out, perfect love casteth out, all fear. I read those words and I realized that if I love the people, if I focused on them and I love the people, that my fear would go away. My fear of speaking the language or anything of that nature would go away and I, I could succeed. And so I applied that principle as a missionary I, I would carry that feeling. I'd say, I love you, I care about you, whoever they were, it didn't matter. And I, I didn't have fear. Now I, I made some mistakes with the language. You know, I, I went, I called a woman a lizard, mm-hmm. and the whole, the, the whole family was baptized, and they all laughed. Uh, on another occasion, I thought it was really being nice. 
it, in those streets of El Salvador, especially, everybody's walking down the street. You know, the kids are trying to sell you chiclets and everybody's walking, carrying things on their head. It's just, you know, it's a cacophony of people. And I thought, you know, I'm going to just say something to them to lift their spirits. And so I thought I was saying, where's your smile as we walked down the street? And the people would smile and some would laugh and so forth. And the, but then my senior companion, because I hadn't been out very long, he said, Elder Brunette, what are you doing? I'm just simply saying to them, where's your smile? He said, no, you're not. You're saying, where's your nose? And I thought, well, they did <laughs> laugh. They were smiling. It seemed to work. So, you know, you, you do the best you can. But I held on to that principle, that principle of perfect love casts without all fear. And I apply that as a missionary. Actually, I've tried to apply that as best I can throughout my life. And it's a principle. It's a true principle. It works. And uh, so just love the people you know, love the people you don't know, be kind, be caring in any way you can be. And um, fear or trepidation or whatever it is that you might be feeling in those circumstances, uh, it will go away. So I I wanted to be sure and share that. Awesome. Actually, Doug, you know, so we're, we're just hitting, we're about to hit our 30th episode. In fact, you might be our 30th episode that we've done. I actually gave my first podcast last week. Oh. So Alicia <laughs> interviewed me and I actually said almost the exact same thing, huh, Alicia? Yep. Um, I was literally just going to say that. Like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Where fear, I had the same, a very similar experience to you, Doug, where I was afraid to do, um, to actually go and do home teaching <laughs> for several years. And, and I, I had this moment where I replaced that fear with love. And amazing things happened in my life. Oh, wow. and so I agree with you. It is a true principle, and and when you replace fear with love, you can do amazing things. So I I love that. That's yeah. that's something that's affected your life so so much. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. That's and you know tremendous. what I think is interesting is sometimes we read these scriptures and we think, of course, they're just for us, right? Like, oh, if I'm afraid, all I have to do is love someone. But the funny thing. The, well, I guess the the thought that I had that came to me when you were talking about that was how um, fear is not just replaced for the person who's doing the loving. It's the person who's feeling the fear and then being loved. You know, I think about like my kids when, you know, even now, right? Like yeah. they will show me anything that they've done and they're so excited about it, right? And it doesn't matter yeah. if they really think it's good or not. They're excited. You know, like my daughter is excited to show me a picture that she drew or my son's excited to, you know, show me a meme he created or a TikTok video that he did or something like that. And it's because they have no fear. Like they know that I love them so much that they don't have to be afraid of what, you know, my reaction is going to be because they know that my reaction is going to be one with, but that's just, that's just love. Right. right and so right. I, I love that you brought that up. I love that Scott brought that up last week um, in our other episode as well, because I think that that's kind of, um, that's the whole point of um, the church's light the world um, campaign or challenge or whatever you want to call it that they do every December is they really truly just want to help the world feel that love of Christ, you know, and of course we should be doing it every day, all year long, you know, um, but Christmas time, I think is just such a nice um I don't know. It's, it's just like, an, it's almost easier sometimes, right? It's yes. easier to yeah. be like, you know, I really want to give love. I really want to share love and share light with the world and stuff like that. So I, it just made me, it just warmed my heart when you brought that up. I was like, you know, this is like the perfect, perfect little wrap up to this show, you know, to your episode, to your story and stuff like that. Cause really that's, that was kind of the, the whole underlying thing, right? Like you felt that love from all of these people that you were able to come in contact with, with the church. And you were able to feel that love with your family as well, despite the, you know, um, differences in faith and stuff like that. Like you just yes. have, you you have so much love in your story. And I just think that that's, it's just beautiful. So thank you so thank much you. for sharing that. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Thank you for this opportunity. Really I'm very grateful. Yeah. Any last thoughts, Doug? Well, just to say, I commend both of you for what you're doing. I think anything 
uh, that will uplift people and help them in their in their life, in their journey, um, uh, in this life. And you are doing that very thing. And uh, I I just I want to commend you for that because we all need to feel that uh, uplifting feeling, that hope, uh, the yeah. purpose of life, and the love that our Heavenly Father and our Savior have for us and, and to share that. And that's what you're doing. And I commend you for that. Well, Thanks. Thank you. I just want to say we, one more. Th- Go ahead. Go say, ahead. We Alicia, couldn't, and then we I'll couldn't say do something. it without you, right? <laughs> like we couldn't do it without people like you who are willing to come on and share your stories and your experiences and your testimonies. So it's a, it's a group effort. <laughs> for thank sure. you. Yeah. Thank you. And I just want to say, Doug, I hope that when I have grandkids that, <laughs> I can have a relationship like like you have with yours because I know just seeing I mean I've only known you for a week but I could tell when you when you were there with with Carson that there was true love there and it was you know and just that bond that you have and and the fact that the gospel helps to create that bond and then it's an eternal bond it's just such an incredible thing Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Mm-hmm. And you will have that experience. Both of you will. <laughs> for sure. Heck yeah, I will. I told my husband, I said, our next house has to be even bigger so I can keep all my grandkids in. <laughs> He's like, our oldest is 16 and just turned 16 on Thanksgiving. Uh, we have time. I'm like, yeah, but we just need to be prepared. So. <laughs> That's right. Good planning. Good idea. Really good. Oh, awesome. Well, again, Doug, thank you so much for joining us, for being our guest today and for sharing your story and your testimony with everyone. Um, you just, I, my cheeks hurt from smiling this whole episode. <laughs> you just made me smile the whole episode. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. And to all of our listeners, thank you guys for um, all of your support, for tuning in and for just really supporting us for reaching out. Uh, if you have a story that you guys would like to share, please be sure to head on over to latterdaylights.com. You can fill out a little form at the bottom of the page. If you'd like to be a guest or you can message us on Facebook. Um, Scott and I, we would, we truly would love to be able to help you to get your message out to the world and, and to maybe light up someone else's life. So be sure to, to reach out if you've got a story that you'd like to share. Yeah. And Um, You know, if you want to help share Doug's story, make sure that you click that share button. Let's get that out there. Let's let's share Doug's story and and get some more light and goodness out into the world. And we are so grateful for you to be here and listen to Doug's story with us. And we hope to see you next week on another episode. Till then, take care and have a great week. Bye. Bye now.